Chapter 1 As the cool night air brushed against my face, excitement surged through me with every step we took deeper into the woods. Snipe hunting was a new adventure, a mysterious quest I was about to embark on with my friends, who I thought knew the woods like the backs of their hands. The unofficial leader of our group, Jake, was the one who'd come up with the idea. He was the kind of guy who thrived on the thrill of adventure, always looking for the next adrenaline rush. His laughter was infectious, and he had a way of making even the most ridiculous plans seem like the best ideas ever. Marcus was the brains of our operation. He wore glasses that always seemed to slip down his nose, a detail that added to his thoughtful demeanor. Marcus was the one we turned to when we needed a plan, a quick fix, or just an ear to listen. Tonight, he carried the map and compass, confident in our path, even as we ventured into unknown territory. Liz, the only girl in our group, was as fierce as she was loyal. Her presence brought a balance to our often chaotic adventures. She had a way of looking at the world that challenged us to see things differently. As we walked, the familiar banter and laughter among us filled the air. There was an ease in our interactions, a bond formed through countless adventures and shared secrets. But tonight, unbeknownst to me, would test that bond in ways I couldn't imagine. We'll be legends after tonight, Jake said, his eyes shining with excitement under the beam of his flashlight. The dense forest seemed to close in around us the darkness a living, breathing entity. I listened to my friends, their voices a tether to normalcy as we moved deeper into the unknown. Here's good, Marcus announced, stopping in a clearing that felt miles away from everything and everyone. Alex, you know what to do. Call out for the snipe, and when you catch it, shout. We'll be nearby, ready to help, he instructed, handing me a sack with a seriousness that belied the supposed simplicity of our task. Don't worry, we've got your back, Liz added, her smile a beacon of reassurance in the shadowy woods. As they disappeared into the night, the reality of my solitude crashed into me. The silence of the woods, once a symphony of night sounds, became oppressive, filled with the weight of unseen eyes watching, waiting. The prank had begun, but I stood alone, unaware, on the precipice of terror and the unknown. Chapter 2 the initial moments by myself were a bizarre blend of thrill and slight unease. I shouted for the snipe, a creature I was beginning to doubt existed, with a mix of eagerness and skepticism. Here snipe, here snipe, I chanted into the void, half expecting some mythical beast to leap into my arms. I felt so stupid. At first, I filled the silence with my own chuckles, a defense against the growing unease. This is part of it, right? The solitude, the waiting. I told myself, trying to rationalize the fear away. But as the night air grew colder, and the shadows seemed to dance with malicious intent, my self-assurance began to wane. Okay, guys, come on out. Joke's over, I called out, my voice less steady than before. The forest remained indifferent, its silence a heavy blanket smothering my pleas. That's when the seeds of panic took root. My thoughts, once allies in adventure, turned traitorous they actually left me. They really did it, I realized with a sinking heart. Anger flared up, a brief, burning beacon against the dread. Damn them. They left me here. In the middle of nowhere. Each curse was a whispered betrayal, a fracture in the trust I had placed in my friends. Fear, once a distant concept, became an overpowering force, wrapping its icy fingers around my mind. The night a blanket of darkness impenetrable by the weak beam of my flashlight, seemed alive with unseen threats. Each crack of a twig was a footstep, each rustle of leaves a whisper of my name. I spun around, half expecting to confront a monster, half hoping to see my friends bursting from the trees with apologies and laughter. But there was nothing. Only me, alone, with the realization that the darkness was not just around me, but creeping within, filling the voids left by abandoned hope. I have to get out of here, I whispered to myself, the declaration a feeble shield against the encroaching terror. The forest, once a place of mystery and adventure, had transformed into a labyrinth of fear and despair. As I stood in the clearing, abandoned and betrayed, I understood the true nature of the hunt. It wasn't the snipe that was being hunted, it was me. And in that moment, the real game began, a game of survival, not against mythical creatures, but against the darkness within and without. Chapter 3. Determination hardened in me like steel. 
I wouldn't let this prank be the end of me. I wouldn't cower in the dark, waiting for rescue that wasn't coming. With a deep, steadying breath, I decided to take control of my fate. Survive, I whispered to myself, the word a mantra against the fear. I tried to recall every survival show I'd ever watched, every bit of advice I'd ever heard. Stay calm, stay smart, I coached myself, my voice sounding alien in the oppressive silence of the forest. My first task was clear, find shelter and make it through the night. Using the moon and stars as my guide, I picked a direction that I hoped would lead me back to civilization, or at least away from the deeper, darker parts of the forest. Every step was cautious, deliberate, as I navigated through the underbrush, avoiding natural pitfalls and the imagined grasp of things that might dwell just beyond the light. Chapter 4 only a few moments had passed since I had returned to the thick forest trying to find my way back to civilization. It wasn't long before the first signs appeared that I was not alone in these woods. At first, it was just a feeling, an inexplicable sense that something was watching me, tracking my every move with unseen eyes. I tried to dismiss it as nerves, the product of my heightened state of fear, but the sensation persisted, growing stronger with every step. Then came the noises, soft at first like the padding of feet on the forest floor, easily mistaken for the natural sounds of nocturnal creatures. But as I continued, the noises became more distinct, more deliberate. Branches snapped behind me, leaves rustled in a pattern that suggested movement, something or someone keeping pace with me just beyond the reach of my flashlight. I spun around, my heart pounding, expecting to catch a glimpse of my friends, ready to confront them, to demand they end this madness. But there was nothing only the dense trees and the darkness. My breath came in short, sharp gasps as I faced the unnerving truth, something else was out there with me. The realization that I was being hunted, by what I could not say, ignited a primal fear within me. I ran, not caring in which direction, only knowing I had to escape whatever lurked in the shadows. The chase had begun, a deadly game of cat and mouse where I was unmistakably the mouse. Chapter 5 the forest around me blurred into a singular mass of darkness as I ran, fueled by adrenaline and terror. My flashlight, once a beacon of safety, now felt like a target on my back, drawing whatever hunted me ever closer. The sounds of pursuit were constant now, a symphony of snaps and rustles that kept pace with my own frantic heartbeat. In a desperate bid for safety, I turned off my flashlight, plunging myself into darkness. I hoped to become invisible to whatever stalked me to throw it off my trail. My eyes strained against the black, and every step became a leap of faith, trusting the ground to be there. It was a mistake. Without my light, I was blind and soon found myself tumbling down a shallow ravine, the ground abruptly giving way beneath me. Pain flared as I hit the forest floor, my breath knocked from my lungs. I lay there for a moment, disoriented, trying to assess the damage. My ankle throbbed painfully, a sprain at least but it was the least of my worries. I fumbled for my flashlight, the need for visibility now outweighing the fear of being seen. The light flickered to life, revealing the steep walls of the ravine that trapped me. Above, the unseen creature prowled, its presence felt more than heard. I was a sitting duck. With effort, I pushed myself to my feet, testing my weight on my injured ankle. Pain shot through me, but it was bearable. I had no choice but to move, to find a way out of this natural trap. Limping, I began to explore the ravine, searching for any slope or handhold that might offer escape. Chapter 6 Time stretched on as I navigated the ravine, each step a battle against pain and fear. The creature, whatever it was, seemed content to let me wander this earth in prison, its presence a constant pressure at the back of my mind. The psychological toll was immense. I found myself jumping at shadows, seeing malevolent eyes in every nook and cranny of the forest. My thoughts began to spiral, the isolation and terror merging into a potent cocktail that clouded my judgment. Was this creature real, or had fear conjured it from the depths of my imagination? Were my friends out there, searching for me, or had they left me for dead? Hallucinations teased the edges of my vision, born from exhaustion and despair. Faces of my friends morphed into grotesque caricatures, mocking me from the darkness. The line between reality and nightmare blurred until I could no longer trust my senses. In a rare moment of lucidity, I recognized the danger of my mental state. I forced myself to focus on tangible tasks, moving, surviving, 
escaping. I clung to the hope that dawn would bring rescue, that I would emerge from this night a survivor. But hope was a fragile thing, easily crushed by the weight of my situation. Chapter 7 Just when I thought I could go no further, my flashlight illuminated a structure through the trees, a cabin, its weathered walls offering the promise of shelter. With renewed purpose, I hobbled toward it, ignoring the whispers of caution that danced at the edge of my thoughts. The door was ajar, hanging crooked on its hinges. Inside, the cabin was a time capsule of abandonment, dust-covered furniture and cobweb-draped corners. It was a refuge, however temporary, and I collapsed inside, allowing myself a moment of rest. As my breathing slowed, I surveyed my surroundings. Among the detritus of a life long gone, I found old newspaper clippings spoke of disappearances in these woods, of a creature of legend that hunted under the cover of darkness. Upon the mantel over the fireplace, I saw a dusty old photo of a family. They seemed happy with the wife holding the small girl and her arm around a large man dressed like a lumberjack and supporting a large axe over his shoulder. Next to the photo was a hunter's journal, its pages yellowed with age, detailed an encounter with something otherworldly, a thing of nightmares that could not be killed. Fear knotted in my stomach as I realized the gravity of my situation. The thing chasing me was real and not my imagination. I fortified the door as best I could, barricading myself inside. Sleep was a distant dream, my every sense straining for any sign of the killer's approach. Just then, from behind me in a dark corner, I heard a noise that shook me to the very core. Something was in here with me. As I steadied my breath, trying to quiet the storm of panic that raged within me, my flashlight's beam caught a movement in the corner of the cabin. There, curled into the smallest ball possible, was Liz, her eyes wide with terror, shimmering in the dim light. Her appearance was a stark testament to the horror she'd endured, clothes torn, face smeared with dirt and tears, and her body trembling uncontrollably. Liz. I whispered, rushing to her side, my own fear momentarily forgotten in the face of her distress. She flinched at my approach, then, recognizing me, clung to me with a desperation that spoke volumes of her ordeal. Through choked sobs, Liz recounted the harrowing tale. They had planned to return, to end the prank and retrieve me, but the woods hid a terror far beyond any childish joke. The Blackwood Slasher, a figure of local legend, a ghost story turned grim reality, had ambushed them. With a lumberjack axe that seemed to gleam with malice in the moonlight, he had claimed Marcus and Jake with swift, ruthless strikes. Liz had escaped by mere seconds, her flight fueled by pure terror leading her to the dubious safety of this cabin. The stories are real, she whispered, a haunted look in her eyes. The Blackwood Slasher. He's out there, and he'll kill us too. As the night waned, a fragile silence enveloped the cabin. The oppressive sense of being hunted had not diminished, yet there was a shift in the air, a suffocating tension that hinted at an impending climax. I realized then that hiding was not an option, the Slasher would never relent and waiting for daylight offered no guarantee of safety. Chapter 8 Determined to take control of our fate, I scanned the cabin for anything that could serve as a weapon or aid in our escape. The fireplace poker Liz had found earlier seemed laughably inadequate against the slasher's axe, yet it was better than facing him unarmed. I gripped it tightly, feeling its weight as a tangible link to survival. We need a plan, I said, my voice low, mindful of the silent hunter outside. We can't stay here forever. He knows we're here, and it's only a matter of time before he decides to come in. Liz nodded, her eyes darting to the door then back to me. What do you suggest we do? We wait for the right moment, I explained, piecing together a strategy from desperation and the slim hope of catching the slasher off guard. When he attacks, we'll use the element of surprise. We run, splitting up if we have to. He can't chase both of us. The plan was fraught with risk, but Liz agreed. The alternative, remaining passive targets, was unthinkable. We moved away from the door, positioning ourselves where we could watch and wait, our nerves stretched taut as bowstrings. Hours passed, each minute an eternity of anticipation and dread. The cabin, a crucible of our fear, seemed to shrink around us, the walls pressing in with the weight of impending doom. Then, without warning, the silence shattered. The door, the very barrier between us and death, exploded inward with a violence that sent splinters flying like shrapnel. The Blackwood Slasher stood in the threshold, 
a monstrous silhouette framed by the moonlight, his axe gleaming with a sinister promise of destruction. The sight of him, the embodiment of every horror story that had ever whispered of the dark, was paralyzing. But terror, the very emotion that rooted me to the spot, also spurred me into action. This was our moment, the culmination of every decision that had led to this point. With a shout that was part war cry, part defiance, I charged. The slasher, taken aback by the sudden assault, swung his axe in a wide arc. I dodged, feeling the whoosh of air slicing at my stomach as the blade missed me by mere inches. Liz seized the opportunity, sprinting for the door, her survival instincts in full throttle. The slasher recovered quickly, turning his attention to Liz. I couldn't let her face him alone. Gritting my teeth against the fear, I lunged, striking him with the poker. It was a futile gesture, like attacking a mountain with a stick, but it bought Liz precious seconds as she darted out the door past him. However, the instant I struck the Blackwood Slasher with the fireplace poker, it became clear how outmatched I was. The blow, which would have incapacitated a normal man, barely phased him. In a swift, terrifying display of his monstrous strength, he grabbed me by the throat, lifting me off the ground with ease. His grip was iron, unyielding, as my feet dangled, kicking futilely in the air. The cold, emotionless eyes behind the ghostly white mask stared into mine, a silent promise of death. As the Blackwood Slasher's vice grip tightened further around my throat, the world began to blur at the edges, my desperate gasps for air becoming more futile by the second. His other hand raised the axe, a silent herald of my impending doom. I could almost feel the cold kiss of the blade when, suddenly, Liz reappeared from the shadows wielding a large rock that took both her hands to hold. With a cry that was both a battle shout and a release of pent-up terror, Liz swung the rock with all her might, striking the slasher squarely on the side of his head. The force of the blow was enough to send him staggering back, his grip on my neck loosening just enough for me to fall to the ground, coughing and gasping for breath. The slasher, momentarily off balance, turned his murderous gaze towards Liz, the promise of death in his eyes. For a moment, Liz froze, realizing the direness of her situation facing a monster that seemed beyond mortal harm. Seeing Liz in mortal danger snapped me back to reality, the adrenaline coursing through my veins banishing any remnants of fear-induced paralysis. Liz. I yelled, my voice a mix of warning and determination. I rushed at the slasher, putting every ounce of desperation and the will to survive into the charge. The impact caught him off guard, and together we crashed into the old wooden table that dominated the center of the cabin. The table, weakened by years of neglect, collapsed under our combined weight, sending us tumbling to the floor in a heap. The slasher was momentarily pinned, his axe clattering out of reach. Seizing the moment, I grabbed Liz by the hand, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and relief. Run! I shouted, pulling her towards the door and into the night beyond. Our feet pounded against the forest floor, every step away from the cabin a victory against the dark fate that had almost claimed us. Behind us, the sound of the slasher rising was a chilling reminder of the relentless nature of our pursuer. The crash of the table and the clatter of his axe being retrieved echoed through the trees, a sinister soundtrack to our flight. We ran without looking back, the terror of being hunted lending speed to our steps. The slasher's pursuit was a terrifying presence in the night, a nightmare from which we desperately sought to awake. But this was no dream, and our escape was a testament to our refusal to succumb to the darkness. The night forest became a blur of shadow and moonlight as we navigated through the trees, driven by primal survival instincts. We didn't know if we could outrun the slasher, this embodiment of relentless malevolence, but we knew we had to try. Every gasping breath, every pounding heartbeat, was a declaration of our determination to live, to escape the horror that hunted us. Chapter 9 As Liz and I sprinted through the forest, the pounding of our hearts matched only by the thunderous steps of the Blackwood Slasher behind us, the night seemed endless, a dark maze with no exit. But amidst the fear and desperation, a glimmer of hope emerged. I remembered the law surrounding the Slasher, tales whispered around campfires and shared in hushed tones among the locals. The Creek. The law held that the Blackwood Slasher, for all his inhuman strength and relentless bloodlust, could not cross the running waters of the creek that sliced through these woods. It was a piece of the legend I hadn't dared to believe until now, until survival depended on every scrap of hope. Liz, the creek. 
I gasped out, my lungs burning with the effort of our flight. He can't follow us across the creek. Understanding flashed in Lizzie's eyes, a mix of hope and renewed fear. The creek wasn't just a natural barrier, it was a line that the slasher could not, or would not, cross. It offered a chance at salvation, a thin sliver of safety in a night that had seen none. We altered our desperate dash, veering towards the sound of running water that suddenly filled the air like a beacon. The ground beneath our feet became damp, the air cooler as we approached the creek, its waters a silver ribbon under the moonlight. Behind us, the slasher's steps grew louder, more determined, as if he sensed our plan. But the law gave us hope, and we clung to it as we clung to each other, running for our lives. Reaching the creek, we didn't hesitate. The water was cold, shockingly so, biting at our skin as we waded through. But the chill was a small price to pay for a chance at escape. We pushed through, the current fighting against us, but the thought of the slasher's inability to follow gave us strength. We emerged on the other side, soaked and shivering, but alive. Turning back and looking over our shoulders, we saw him. The Blackwood slasher stopped at the edge of the creek, his dark figure looming like a specter of death. He didn't enter the water. Instead, he stood there, watching us with those cold, emotionless eyes, as if memorizing our faces, our souls, for a vengeance that would never come to pass. We didn't stop running, didn't pause to see if the law held true. The possibility that we might have been wrong about the law, that the slasher could, in fact, follow us across the creek, fueled our flight. We ran, our soaked clothes heavy on our bodies, the woods around us a blur of shadow and moonlight. The sound of the creek faded behind us, replaced by the pounding of our own hearts and the ragged sound of our breathing. We dared not slow down, dared not believe we were safe until we were far away from the woods, away from the realm of the Blackwood Slasher. Chapter 10 The time following our escape from the Blackwood Slasher were a blur of disbelief, relief, and an underlying current of unshakable trauma. Liz and I, bound by the shared ordeal, found solace in each other's company, our relationship deepening into something beyond friendship. We became a testament to survival, to the idea that even in the darkest nights, there can be a dawn. We reported our harrowing experience to the local police, insisting on the reality of the danger lurking in those woods. But when they searched the area, guided by our fragmented directions and fueled by a skeptical curiosity, they found nothing. No cabin, no sign of the violence we had described, and no trace of Marcus and Jake. The forest kept its secrets, the slasher's existence relegated to the realm of local legend once more. The lack of evidence, the whispers of doubt, couldn't erase what we had endured. Liz and I knew the truth of that night, the terror we had faced, and the loss of our friends. It was a reality we lived with every day, a shadow that followed us even as we tried to move on. Moving out of the state was a mutual decision, an attempt to distance ourselves from the physical location of our nightmare. A new start, a chance to rebuild away from the memories and the whispers, from the pitying looks and the unspoken questions. Our new life together was a slow healing process, marked by moments of joy tinged with the knowledge of how quickly everything could be taken away. We supported each other, understanding the nightmares that sometimes claimed our sleep, the sudden fears that darkness could bring. I will never forget that night, nor will Liz. The experience has left its indelible mark on us, a reminder of our vulnerability and the strength we found in facing it together. The End